My name is Allie Franklin Carter, and in uh, September of 1955, I joined the U.S. Navy under their electronics training program. I wanted to become a radar uh, technician, and so I went to uh, basic training in Great Lakes, Illinois, and went to ET school in Great Lakes, Illinois. Graduating in the fall of 1957, I think it was around October, and I chose as my duty station, a uh, radar picket ship called the USS Kretschmer, DER-329. It was a converted destroyer escort, and it was destined to have the latest radar equipment that the Navy had for air search and surface search. And we were stationed in the North Atlantic between Argentia, Newfoundland, and the Azor Islands. We were stationed across that, and we tracked everything that we uh, could see both on the surface and in the air, and we reported it to NORAD in uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado. And if it was an unknown, they would scramble fighters out of West Westover Mass to come out and investigate if we had an unknown target. Had a very unusual experience. I was a radar specialist, and my job was to maintain the radars aboard the ship. In 19, in the, uh, let's see, it would have been this early summer of 1957. Uh, I was, a, I also, because the ship was undermanned, I also served as a radar operator. So I served four on and eight off uh, duty watches as an operator if there was nothing wrong with the radar. And I got off duty one night at midnight and went to bed and I was uh, called and told to come fix the radar, there was something wrong with it. And so when I got up to CIC and I asked them what the problem was, they said, well, we're tracking an aircraft here at 3,400 miles an hour. And I said, well, there is something wrong. So I took that radar offline, put the standby radar online and went to work. And I started running all the tests and everything was normal. And I completed all of the preliminary tests that you would run to check out a radar and it, everything checked out absolutely normal. So I went back into CIC and I said, what did the, the uh, target just before this, what did they do? And I said, well, they were perfectly normal. It was an airliner and it was the right course and speed. And by this time, an hour had gone by and I said, well, what are you tracking now? And they said, well, on the other radar, everything's tracking fine. So I said, well, let's put this back on. We put it back online and they were tracking normally. Everything's normal. So uh, as a result of talking with them, I said, I can't find anything wrong with the radar. But there was clearly, they had clear plots, and they told me, said, this is an absolute stellar contact because you usually get the size of the blips usually do with either the size of the contact or the shape, something. That, and this was a blip that was better than a half inch across, which indicated a really large target or something very close. And uh, so they said it tracked every sweep. We got a blip. And if you get anomalies, usually what will happen is uh, every sweep or every other sweep, you'll get a blank or maybe every 10 sweeps, but it'll blank out. But this one was solid on every sweep, and that indicates a solid target. So I asked the, the uh, uh, duty officer if he was going to report it, and he said no. And I said, why not? And he said, well, he says, you've just told me there's nothing wrong with the radar. You've run all the checks you can run. There's nothing wrong with the radar. We know we tracked the thing. If we report it, then Colorado Springs is going to ask us what's wrong with our equipment. And you've already said there's nothing wrong. So you and I then have a problem. We both are in trouble. We got to come up with a story. And he says, I'm not going to report it. It was one contact. That was it. I said, that's fine with me. So I went back to bed. So one night I was on the plot board, this was maybe three or four months later, and here comes this contact. And the second blip, you, know, you could see that this thing was moving. It was moving like three or four inches on a 360 mile scale. And so sure enough, I plotted it and it was 300, I mean 3,400 miles an hour. And uh, again, we didn't report it, but they says, you know, there's nothing wrong. This is our friend back, and away we went. And nobody thought anything about it. It was interesting. Uh, we didn't make a big deal out of it, but as we sure like to know what that was. 3,400 miles an hour in 1957. And the closest thing that we had 
was about 1,100 miles an hour that had ever been told to us that we might have or might encounter. It happened during the year, the last part of 57 and up until May of 58, it happened at least three more times that I had radar operator friends that would tell me, well, we had another one of those fast ones last night. And, and it always was at night. That's the only other anomaly. I couldn't tell you what time of night. I doubt very seriously that in 1956 and 57 that the U.S. had craft, even in the experimental stage, that could fly 3,400 miles an hour repeatedly. I think that in particular where this was, if this would have been a test range or we'd have been sitting down in uh, somewhere in the Utah and you know they could have been coming over from Nevada or something like that, that's, that's different. But we're sitting in the middle of the North Atlantic with it at least 1,200 miles to any land. So they were flying around the top of the, the globe uh, with those kinds of speeds for those lengths of time to get from land point to land point, I don't believe we had anything because I was kept abreast and we were told of all of the latest missiles, all of the latest aircraft that any of the foreign countries had. I was uh, on a secret on a need to know basis, but I was shown radar systems and uh, other stuff that was from Russia and I'm quite sure that uh, the people were concerned about the fact that they didn't know what it was, we didn't have anything that would fly that fast, and that they decided to limit that information not to let the Russians know what we didn't have or didn't know. And they, they didn't want anybody to know anything about what we were seeing. And I think that started it, and then it got out of hand. But I know that the only people that they're keeping it secret from today are the Americans. Everybody else knows about it and accepts it and all the other governments in the world except England and the U.S. primarily are accepting it. It's very irritating to me uh, personally to see that go on because uh, I have thought a lot about how your life would change if the government came out tomorrow and said that uh, we've been lying to you. Well, we all know now that that would be nothing new. They've lied to us for about almost anything, but I think people are at the point where they could accept the fact that they're going to have to make their car payments and their house payments next week the same way they did before this announcement. When people talk to me about the fact that they may be the figment of my imagination, I was a damn good ET. I knew, I knew my radar. It was my love at the time and I know the systems and I knew that there was nothing wrong with those systems and I knew that we were tracking real contacts. I knew the difference between what they call running rabbits and chaff and uh, all of the other stuff that they would give us. A psychologist was from uh, the University of Missouri Medical School was making a presentation and as a part of his presentation he was explaining how much uh, grief he was taking from the faculty and wanting to know why he was involved in something like UFOs and he said I'll tell you why I have this guy as an example as a client he was in the Air Force and he was in the, uh, Alaska and he was on the dew line he tracked things at 3400 miles an hour and they told him he was crazy and he's still now all these years later this was in the late 50s and he's now having psychological problems and I'm trying to help people like him and I figured that's what I was trained for and that's why I'm doing it. And he says, surprisingly, they kind of leave me alone. But when he said 3,400 miles an hour, I made the effort to track him down after his talk and got the name of the client and actually talked to this client who was a sergeant in the Army, I mean the Air Force. His name was Dave Wallace. And he had been on the dew line with the big stationary uh, uh, ballistic missile radars that they had, the Bemuse system. And he said, yes, we tracked them at 3,400 miles an hour. And he says, the interesting part of it was we tracked them three and 400 miles out in space. And he says, we complained to the uh, uh, radar people, it was the General Electric had built the system. And so we kept reporting this stuff and they kept telling us we couldn't report that stuff out there. So we said, well, we are doing it, and it is real. And so they came in and actually made movies of the scope 
And when they took them back and analyzed what they were seeing, they came back and put a fix into the radar so their distance into space was like 12 or 15 miles. They said, that's all the ballistic missiles will ever go. You don't need to see any further. So they just limited the uh, receivers to where they would, uh, I mean, the, the scope to where it would only expand to where they could see 12, 15 miles out in space. I talked to a, uh, a lady uh, came forward about two years ago that was an Army radar operator stationed in California during the 50s. And she also reported that she had, had tracked craft at 3,400 miles an hour, which seemed to be a kind of a common speed at that point. But she said uh, that she had done that with the Army and that they too would refuse to report. never met the man, but I talked to him on the phone, and he had been in the Navy, and he had tracked on a destroyer in the Gulf of Mexico. They had tracked an underwater craft, and there were a squadron of ships on maneuvers in the Gulf, and they said that they had a solid target from two or three of these ships, and that they tried to uh, that we call it hemming it in. You try to get over it and around it where it can't get away from you. And they said they, it escaped every time they tried to do that and then it would stop and they'd go back and get, and it was kind of like it was playing with them. And they did that for two or three hours one day and it finally took off. I investigated a, a military sighting uh, that was a friend of mine that we knew each other in business for about seven or eight years and he did not know that I had any interest in UFOs and I did not know that he knew what a UFO was until I had uh, seen him make a report of a sighting one day so I called him up and talked to him about it and he says well that was nothing to what I saw when I was in the Air Force and he says I'll tell you about it sometime so I made arrangements to go down and spend the day with him and he told me about his sighting when he was a lieutenant. He was a navigator on an RB-36, which had the big cameras and they did the, all of the secret photographing back in the 50s. And he was a, the navigator on one of these. There were 22 people aboard this craft. And it was up over North Dakota. And somebody called, he, he said it was the tail the guy from the tail gunner section called and says, you know, look out over the left wing. And out about, they estimated 100 yards from the left wing was this 100 foot disc. And this was a clear day. He says they talked to the radar control tower and they had it on radar. And that they got all of the guys that got up and went and took pictures of it. They had been given cameras. Now this is another part, that, the secrecy thing. They had been given 35 millimeter cameras and told how to fill out a report if they saw a UFO in there, but they were a reconnaissance bomber group. And so he said all 22 guys got up and looked out the window and saw this thing for about five or six minutes and then it just took off. I've talked to him about it many times. We've had a number of discussions about this secrecy issue and it was interesting when he landed when when this ship when this plane landed off of their mission they were met by uh, he called it a recce tech it was a and I don't know what that means it was an Air Force group and they debriefed all of these people told them that they could not discuss it for 12 years that they were under secrecy oath and then a week later a group from Washington came out and debriefed them and reminded them of their secrecy oath they confiscated all the camera and the films and everything, they took all the film. Oh yeah, they had pictures of it. And he said they took all the film. And then uh, when he was discharged from the Air Force, he was a colonel in the reserves. And when he was discharged finally from the reserves in the retirement, they reminded him again that he had signed the secrecy oath about this. I, I, there's just no real reason for it except that it got to be a policy and everybody's afraid to change that policy, but then I look at it, and the Chinese have all our Russian secrets, all of our uh, atomic secrets, and all of our missile secrets, and yet the American people can't be told that there's possibly craft out here from another era, and another, another part of the solar system or the universe, and uh, that they can't handle it, which is, is a ridiculous argument. But I think it's important 
that we recognize that there are civilizations that we need to communicate with. And I think we've reached that point in our evolution as a, as a human race that we need to recognize that. And the thing that disturbs me is that the U.S. is going to be a third world nation in, in that field if we're not careful by having all of this secrecy and refusing to set up any kind of diplomatic protocols as, as I know that you have called for and I believe in very strongly because they're out there. Other nations recognize them and they're going to talk to the people that are willing to talk to them on a peaceful basis. And, and we can do what we want to, but that's the reality of it. And uh, so I'm hoping that people will come to their senses and stop hiding this stuff from the U.S. citizens. I mean, it's appalling to me to know that we can have the kind of sightings that they've had in Mexico City and you never hear one single word in the national press of the U.S. That's appalling. That, that's, that's an indictment of our system that you can't believe. I mean, they're reporting this stuff in, you know, in China, they're reporting it in Cuba, they're reporting it everywhere, except the U.S. <laughs>